Hey, so a couple things just before I s start with back with physics. The, the tenth and final problem set, I, I s accidentally had it scheduled from way back to be due today, right after Thanksgiving holiday, which is not intended. That's probably left over from editing last year's schedule into this year's schedule. It's, it's due Friday, last problem set. It's about harmonic oscillator things and musical instruments, which are ultimately harmonic oscillator things too. Okay? Um, just for those of you who, ha who, who haven't heard me say this before, the, the final exam is a 60 question, multiple choice question, uh, test. It's, I, I think of it, so it's twice as long as, as a midterm. I think of it as the third midterm, that's, that's half of it, 30 questions. And the other 30 questions are open season on the semester. And as always, look at the old exams as a way to figure out what you do or don't know. And any other questions, issues about the structure of the class? At some point, the course evaluation will go up. It might be up now. I don't know when it goes up. Is it up now? Yeah. Um, do complete it. And the, the, my, my, uh, the, the, the gift associated there with is that, that I drop your lowest problem set score if you do complete it. I don't know who completes what. I mean, I, I do know who completes it. I don't know what you individually say. Yeah, Jane? When is my last office hours? I'll keep doing office hours as normally scheduled up until the exam, so uh, the Wednesday before the exam's on Saturday. Sorry about that it happens. All right? It's December 14th in the morning, 9 o'clock. All right. Um, okay, so before I go back to musical instruments, just a blast from the past here. I told you back in the days of clothing insulation and climate about double pane windows, special double pane windows, and I, I checked in with Charlottesville Glass and Mirror and they didn't have this until recently, until like a couple days ago. This is a, a failed low E double pane window. So this is a double pane window that has a special coating inside and I could have disassembled, it's hard to get this thing apart. Um, it's, it's meant to be sealed, two panes of glass with trapped gas in between and it's supposed to be trapped forever. Alas, it sprung a leak somewhere along the line and uh, air got in there and with air went moisture and the moisture attacks the special coating. But I'll remind you what the special coating is. I don't know whether you can, s I can see the special coating from here. There's a little bit of a, color, a colored look to this glass. Uh, it's, it's the back pane that I'm touching with my thumbs. That special coating it is reflective in the infrared. It's a mirror in the infrared. So you can't see it normally. You can't see it at all because in the visible it's transparent. But if you go to the infrared, it's shiny. And the value of that is it, the exchange of heat by way of thermal radiation between the front pane, this one, and the back pane is almost turned off. Because the front pane is able to radiate thermal radiation it's essentially black in the infrared. So it radiates thermal radiation at the back pane, but the back pane's a mirror and just reflects the thermal radiation back at the front pane. So the front plane, uh, pane sees itself reflected and doesn't exchange, you know, heat, exchanges heat with itself by thermal radiation. The back pane is terrible at either emitting or absorbing thermal radiation and it basically doesn't. So the two do not interact strongly by way of thermal radiation. Great system. The one downside is that you, th th those coatings at least have historically been fragile. Uh, you don't want to touch it and you also, that, sh that mirror, that, the heat mirror it's called, that coating uh, is water sensitive and chemical sensitive and so if the things spring, spring a leak, they go cloudy or colorful and that's a typical failure of one of these windows and so you've probably seen windows, in fact this building has numerous windows that are double pane like this that have failed, including several in my office. Um, it just is what it is. I just live with it. Anyway, uh, when you get around to getting home, uh, homes of your own perhaps, and are picking out windows, this is, it, it's the real thing. It's not a hype. That, the, the, that, those low E, short for low emissivity, as in mirrored, uh, coatings are worth the money. 
There, so there's a big, good innovation that cuts the thermal leakage in and out of a house and cuts your heating bill and potentially helps save the world. All right, any questions about low E coatings? I, I had thought to try to cut the damn thing open and, and use the infrared camera to show you it's shiny, but I simply cut my hand instead. Okay, not a lot. <laughs> it's like, no, I'm not gonna do this. All right, so musical instruments is the topic at hand, and let me sort of walk through stuff that I did do on Monday with those of you who are here. I'll, I'll do it again just uh, more, more carefully to talk about that if you have just a single object, one mass and one restoring force about a stable equilibrium, and that one restoring force happens to be spring-like, you get one harmonic oscillator, like this bowling ball pendulum up here. It's a single harmonic oscillator. It, fills the, it fulfills the requirements. It has a stable equilibrium, not right now, but if I got it down here, it would. And as you take it away from equilibrium, the restoring force is proportional to displacement. Double the displacement, you double the restoring force. That gives you a harmonic oscillator. And if you have a harmonic oscillator, the nice thing about it is the period of the motion, how many seconds it takes to complete a motion, or equivalently, the frequency of the motion, how many motions it goes through, it cycles of motion per second. They don't depend on the amplitude of the motion. You can go a little or a lot, you get the same period or the same frequency. Okay, if you now, instead you take a, a, a material, so, a, something like a rope that has an, a, a one dimension at least, and one dimension is, turns out to be the right choice, one dimension of extension. So this rope has a length and pretty much nothing else to, important. It now has lots of little pieces that can move somewhat independently, not entirely, because they're, of course, they're connected to each other. And as a result, it can do all kinds of crazy motions, you know, all, all sorts of stuff. And it looks like it's a mess, like you know, how you describe that motion, Ugh, who knows. However, all those complicated motions turn out to be uh, the super, what's called the superposition, the, the sum of individual motions that are simple. So you can add together, oddly enough, simple motions to get the crazy mess, okay? What are the simple motions? The simple motions, which are called the modes of oscillation or modes of vibration, um, are, start with what's called the fundamental mode. And the fundamental, I'll give myself a little more room to work. The fundamental mode, I could go up and this, this up, up and down, it, it would, be, would be fine. I can go in a circle and I'll get the same mode. This, I'm gonna go in a circle. This is play jump rope here. This is the fundamental vibrational mode of a string, of a rope. It is the simplest motion it can take and it has the lowest frequency, longest period for, for the given circumstances. I can make things go faster around their, through, their, through their motions, but no slower than this. And this motion, again, fundamental vibrational mode, it, whether I go around in a circle or whether I go up and down, it's the same mode, it's just harder to get the up and down. I'll stick with a circle. Uh, the circle motion, oddly enough, is, is the up-down motion plus the back and forth motion added together so that, the, so that you move the rope in a circle. If you add them differently, they go in a circle backwards. But this, that's, that's for the world of you know, mathematical physicists, so don't worry about it. Anyhow, when, when the string is vibrating in this mode, it does have a equilibrium. The equilibrium is straight. And so I have distorted it away from equilibrium, and different parts have moved different distances from equilibrium, which might seem like it's a nasty, messy thing. What's the official displacement then? What's, between this and, I'll go forward, and this, what's the, What's the amplitude of motion? Well, it's the amplitude of the peak. In that middle, the middle section, which is called the antinode, the part that's moving the most, that identifies the amplitude of this motion. And amazingly enough, the entire string is experiencing restoring forces locally, all the pieces that are exactly proportional to that amplitude. 
So this string is obeying the rules for a harmonic oscillator. Uh, it, you know, it's an extended object that's doing this arc, but it's actually a harmonic oscillator. Mathematically, it's the same as a harmonic oscillator. It has a stable equilibrium, this. And when you distort it away from stable equilibrium as an arc, and the arc is trigonometrically the sine function, um, it's the trigonometric sine function. When you distort it away, the restoring force is proportional to how far away from center the, the middle, the anti-node, the, the, the biggest moving part is from center. So it has, this has, it meets the criteria of a harmonic oscillator. It has a period, or equivalently a frequency, that doesn't depend on how big the, the arc is. So whether I, whether I do a little jump rope, you know, jump rope for mice, or jump rope for, for elephants, I get the same frequency. And that's very important for musical instruments, as we'll come back to in a second. So far, this okay? Are questions about this? this is, so this is the fundamental mode. It depends on a couple things. Uh, if I change this string for one that is not as massive and left everything the same. So this is a pretty massive rope, actually. You know, it's got a, it's got a, it's a, probably a, there's probably a kilogram of rope between me and that, the other end. If I replace it with a string and left nothing, and changed nothing, it would have less mass, so it would accelerate faster. It would go through its motion faster, so it would suddenly become a faster jump rope, all else being equal. So the mass of the rope matters, and the, the frequency with which it goes through, and I, I hope you can follow the idea that period and frequency are related. In fact, they are reciprocals of one another. The frequency is one over the period and vice versa. So if I go to a string, the frequency goes up. There's less mass, goes through its motion faster. You get a, you get a, a faster trip through the, through the motion. Uh, on the other hand, the restoring force that's, that's involved here depends on two things. It depends on the tension in the rope. If I have no tension in the rope, there's, it's, it, doesn't do, it doesn't have a stable equilibrium anymore. So I have to, to pull the, the rope taut. I, I pr produce tension in it. The tension is measured by the amount of force I exert on the rope, pulling it one way, and not surprisingly, the, the, the peg over at the other end is pulling it equally hard in the opposite direction, so it's got no net force, at least left, right. So more tension stiffens the restoring force makes it fight harder to get back towards center. So I can speed up the jump rope by pulling harder. So I'll pull harder, and now I'll go through the motion. Look, much faster, right? If I go, if I go limp, limper, it's slower. So the tighter I pull it, the faster it goes. OK? Third feature, the thir third thing that affects frequency. So, so the mass of the rope affects frequency. The tension in the rope affects frequency, and the length of the rope affects frequency. If I make the rope shorter, so I'll come in here. I, I'm doing two things. One is I'm cutting the mass of the rope, and that makes things go faster. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm making it so that when it goes off center by an inch, it's more sensitive to that, because that bends the rope more, more abruptly than going off center an inch when it's this long. If I make it longer, it doesn't care as much about being displaced from center. So a short rope, has, it's got a sort of a double effect, less mass, uh, stiffer restoring force, and it goes faster too. So I'm not, I'm not even pulling very tight and it's going, ah, it's going faster. If I go to a very long rope, and you, if kids still play jump rope uh, in, in the real world, not, I'm not talking about a virtual reality jump rope app, um, the longer you make the string, the slower it goes. Is that okay? So just to, to come over before I keep, keep going too far on this, if you come over to a, to, a, to a stringed instrument, it's the same thing. I have the world's downstairs, the world's least expensive, really cheapest violin. It was probably, even probably the six-year-old who made it wasn't very proud of it. Um, and it's, it, it, it's, I can't bring it up anymore, I'm tired of it. Okay, so, so I brought in a guitar instead. So the guitar has six strings, ostensibly all the same length initially, but they have different masses, and they also have different tensions. 
And the most massive string is also the least tense string. So it has a lot of mass, that slows things down. It has low tension, that slows things down. It goes through its motion slowly. So it's got a low pitch. Okay? And the, sh the, the highest pitch string has very little mass. It's, it's quite thin. It's pulled very taut. At least it was. I haven't tuned it forever. Um, very taut. And it goes through its motions rapidly. Much higher pitch. And that's, and that's why. It's, it's a mass issue and it's a tension issue. And you can, on the fly, change the pitch of these strings by changing their lengths. So if you take the low pitch one, which was down here, remember, and cut its length in half, which I'm going to do by pressing the string against the fret so that it, it touches here. This is the new end of the string. And now its pitch should have gone up by about a factor of two. In fact, it's exactly a factor of two. How do I know that? It, we, the way we hear, um, we, we actually hear, we don't hear frequency exactly, but we hear intervals, the differences between pitches. I mean, some people have perfect pitch and can really hear frequency and effect. But, but you can hear a factor of two in sound fairly easily. It's known musically as an octave, and it's the difference between ba and ba, ba, ba. That's a factor of two in frequency. And we hear them almost like they're the same sound. And so when, when men and women sing together, they, since they have different frequency ranges available to them, for the most part, um, they typically sing octaves apart in the simplest of situations. So you can, so you, you can do factors of two, you know, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, okay, sorry. Anyway, um, those, fact, those are factors of two, those are octaves. And the other, another interval that we're pretty sensitive to is a fifth. So it would be ba, 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 ba. That's that, that th those three notes are actually a factor of, first one's a factor of two, the second one's a factor of, of three over the, over the first one. In principle, I could play them on the violin, on the, not violin, on the guitar if I paid more attention, but I won't. OK, so you can't, the, 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 these stringed instruments in general, their fundamental vibrational mode is chosen by the length of the string, the mass of the string, and the tension in the string. And the on-the-fly changes in, in the pitch of a string are typically done by changing the length of the string, playing with, playing with where it ends. Is that OK? All right, so that's, these are all, this is all the world of fundamental vibrational modes. What else is possible on a string? I told you that this whole sloppy mess can be, can be decomposed into simple modes. Well, this is, this is the fundamental vibrational mode, which occurs at, a, at one unit of frequency, let's say. But if I go twice as fast with my jiggling, I should be able to get, there he goes. I've got, I've got the second harmonic go mode going. Where the, where the string is vibrating as two one-half length strings with a node in the middle, a node being a spot that doesn't move. So this is, it's, this is the same motion as if I went here to the, to the node and just did it by itself. But I'm doing, it, I'm doing two parts of it at once. And maybe I can get three. I haven't tried three. Let's go for three. They get, they get messier and messier. We had a gadget last time that, that does it mechanically. And, oh, oh, come on. I had it for a second. I have to pick the right frequency because it, there we go. Hey, woo! All right. OK, so you get the, the idea. Those are the harmonics. So the fundamental is the, the, the simplest way the string can vibrate. It's a single arc, again, a trigonometric sine function. and. Um, the string can also vibrate in its second harmonic mode as two half strings going in opposite directions or three one-third strings going in alternating directions. And because the effective string is getting shorter by factors of two and then three, and so the frequency is going up by a factor of two and three. 
And so when the string is vibrating, it's fundamental, it's, it's the lower note of my, my octave and, and my fifth. When it's vibrating as two half strings, it's, vib it's, in the, it's one octave up, factor of two in frequency. And when it's vibrating as three one third strings, it's yet another factor of, uh, it's up at three times the fundamental frequency, and it's up by a fifth above the octave. And if you go up to the fourth harmonic, you get the second octave, and so on. All right? Question about the, the problem set. For those of you who are, came in late, it's, it, it's assigned now, it's up now, it's due on Friday, Friday class time. Okay, so, so when you pluck or otherwise get a string going, it vibrates, depending on how you do it, it it's typically mostly in its fundamental mode but it also has some of the other vibrations present in it, the, the second harmonic, third harmonic. It's got a more complicated collection of vibrations going on. Uh, I should say the second harmonic, because it has two half strings, effectively has a, less mass, because each half string is, is, is doing the job, and it, so it's got half the mass, and it's got half the length. So it's, it, that causes it to double its frequency. Uh, I can probably excite, you know, it, to, to excite is a is, is, is physics term. Uh, excite the higher uh, vibrational modes by plucking it strategically. If I pluck near the end, I, yeah, it's, it gets a little harsher. If I pluck it in the middle, I get, I'll get a mellow, f the fundamental only. Are you hearing that okay? I can't tell whether my microphone picks up. If I go really to the end and pluck it there, It gets, I think it gets harsher. It's not as dramatic as I might like. By harsher, I mean like more brassy. Uh, brass instruments, as we, you know, we'll talk about them later, uh, have a lot of harmonic in them. And so that, that, that shrill character to them is that not only are you getting the low note, but you're getting these other notes coming out simultaneously. And they add a, a sort of a sharpness to the, to the sound. Um, probably the most mellow uh, instruments are like, like a flute is almost a pure fundamental. Um, guitar is evidently pretty close to a pure fundamental. And I can't get it to go to the other ones. All right. Um, what to do next with this? As a sort of another path to go off for briefly, I, last. Last Monday, I, I did, a, did a demonstration that I'm not going to repeat, which is breaking a, a wine glass with sound. And, ah, you know, whatever. I've done, done enough. You can look for it on the web, right? There are zillion, such, zillion demonstrations of it. Um, in the movies or cartoons or whatever, it's, someone breaks, breaks glass just by, by being shrill or shrieky. No, 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 no. To, if you want to use sound to break uh, a wine glass in any other, you know, uh, the sound from an explosion will break it, but that's boring. If you wanted to do it in an interesting way, it's you get something vibrating at the same uh, pitch as the fundamental vibration of the wine glass. And wine glasses, oddly enough, do have a fundamental vibration. I showed it to you, to you last time. Uh, it turns out that if you have two objects, that share the same resonance, they, they vibrate at the same frequency, then energy can move from one to the other and back again fairly easily by, by what's called sympathetic vibration. And sympathetic vibration is, 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 is present throughout mu musical si situations. And let me show you sympathetic vibration. Um, probably the most direct demonstration of it is this. Here I've got two pendula. And they have the same frequency. Equivalently, they have the same period. It's about one second. It's a little longer than one second. They're a little longer than, one, than a quarter meter, so I know just because I know that, that that determines frequency. So they're very similar, right? And if I have one of them sitting here and the other one swinging, it, it, it's possible for the energy that's in this motion 
of course, it's got excess energy. It's got an equilibrium, but it can't sit at the equilibrium until it runs out of energy. It's possible for the energy from this one to convey itself into that one and get that one moving together with it. And because they have the same frequency, that transfer can occur in a very gentle, rhythmic transfer. And so I'm going to connect them gently with a spring. And what the spring does is it has very little effect on the frequencies of these guys or the periods of these. But this guy, as it goes back and forth, will give gentle pushes to that guy once per cycle and gradually get this one going at the expense of this guy giving gentle pushes at that one and gently getting that one stopped. So let me get it going and I can talk about it. So you can see this one is losing its energy. It's slowing down. That one's speeding up. This is almost it stopped. Okay? Now the reverse is happening. It's coming out of this one and going into that one. And now that one stopped. So you see the transfer? Back and forth, back and forth. And it really only occurs uh, well when these two have the same resonant frequency. They like the same frequency. And so the, the rhythmic pushes are always in cycle, are always in phase. They always, the pushes always add energy to one and take it from the other until all the energy is moved. So it happens in, the, in, this, you know, in a gadget like this. It can also happen between two tuning forks. And I talked about tuning forks in the context of clocks. They're, in some respects, a, a solid piece of material with the middle cut out. So they vibrate such that the ends go toward each other, compressing the middle, the springy middle, and then the ends go apart from each other, stretching the, the, the springy middle and back and forth. So if I just get a tuning fork going, and the, it's, it's times are going back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. As a separate observation before going to this one is, you don't hear very much, right? It's, it's really hard to hear that. Why? Because these guys are not very good at launching sound. So I'm now I'm a little off on a brief tangent. I'll come back to it um, and do it right. These guys by themselves don't launch much sound. They do better when they're attached to something like a box, a surface. And now this guy, I can't whack it against my shoe anymore. Can you hear it coming at you? Okay. This guy is not vibrating. So, so it's clearly vibrating. Let, this guy, not so much. Now let me get this guy going. And let it talk to that guy. Pretty subtle. Let me go, let me do it again. What I'm trying to do is get this. When I hit it too hard, I get other vibrations going that are not the ones that I want. Okay, the energy transfer. Because because these two have the same resonant frequency, getting one going and and, and launching sound. Gets, allows it to, to transfer the energy rhythmically. One, one push every sort of every swing of the, of the kid on the swing. You're pushing, and because the resonance is the same, you don't have to look. You just keep pushing it at your, at your favorite frequency, and if the kid moves at your favorite frequency, you'll add energy on and on. So that's sympathetic vibration. Do we have any other demonstrations of sympathetic vibration here? No, but the, but the wine glass is, is, was the, was the the reason for the demonstration is, is it sort of the extreme case of sympathetic vibration. If you get some, some object going, vibrating, at the same frequency that the, that the wine glass has as its fundamental mode, the energy will transfer by way of push after push after push and build up. And I, I didn't use one wine glass transferring energy to another wine glass. We used a speaker system transferring energy to the wine glass. The speaker system's got no end of energy available to it. So it just kept investing energy in the wine glass until the wine glass tore itself apart. That's how that works. And for that to work well, uh, you want a wine glass or, or some object that has a very good resonance. That is, it's, it, it has a frequency that it really likes and all the other frequencies it doesn't care much about. Really likes that one and it's able to go through lots of cycles of that motion without losing much energy. And that's true of wine glasses. 
It's true of most musical instruments, too. Uh, you can make objects that have a resonance, but one that wastes energy so fast that, that you, you don't hear a, a clear tone, and it doesn't last very long. You hear the tone? It's kind of a thunk, 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 thunk. It doesn't last very long. This thing does have various vibrational modes. That was probably the fundamental vibrational mode of this crazy shape. But it can't keep the energy. It wastes the energy by internal friction and stuff like that. Whereas something like this, because of, of the material from which it's made and how it's made, it keeps the energy really well. So I can, I can, well, I'll send it at you guys. Still got the energy. Still got the energy. Still got the energy. In fact, it's, it's losing energy maybe mostly by sound. It's, the sound carries energy with it, not surprisingly. And so this has a lovely resonance that is long lived. It, it, la it keeps the motion going hundreds, thousands of cycles of motion. The, that pendulum will keep its, mo its motion going hundreds, thousands of cycles. Uh, something like the Coke bottle, not so much. You know, a stick. This thing. You know, it's doing dozens of motions, but not much. It's not, it has a resonance. It's not all that long lived. Okay? So, for sympathetic vibration, it works best, obviously, when you have two things that share the same frequency of their primarily fundamental mode of vibration, and ones that keep the energy well, that go through the fundamental vibrational mode, motion over and over and over and over. Where, so where would this show up in musical instruments? In pretty much any musical instrument that's capable of emitting sound, it doesn't have something damping the sound, like, like a, in a piano, the strings are, are when, they're just, when the piano's just sitting there, the strings are damped. They have things touching them, felt, that is trying to suck the energy out of them so that they don't make any sound. So that's not good. Lift the dampers, which you can do with one of the pedals on the piano, and now all the strings are sitting there waiting to vibrate, capable of vibrating. If you play uh, the, the tone that one of those strings is, is, is set up to emit, that its favorite frequency, if you play that tone on any other instrument, it will start to vibrate. So I, I encourage you to try this. You know, so basically, if you whistle at it, at its favorite frequency, it will start to vibrate. Um, interestingly enough, if you take, remember the octaves are, uh, are, are a factor of two in frequency. The lower, the lower note, the lower octave on a piano, its fundamental is lower, but its second harmonic is one octave higher. It's the same note as the one octave up string is, is plays as its fundamental. So the point is, the two, the two strings are capable of emitting the same tone. It's just in one case, it's the second harmonic. If you hit that note hard, while the other, the high, one octave higher string is, is able to vibrate, no damper, this, the higher string will start to vibrate. So try, try this, if you've got a piano or you play the piano, you can get that string going by hitting the, the octave lower. It, the reverse is not, not so true because the higher note doesn't, the, the higher, higher it, it's not so true. I, I'll stop at that. Okay? So the stringed instruments, nearly all the stringed instruments use what, what I've just described as, you know, as their basis. They have strings of a, of a chosen mass, chosen tension, chosen length, adjustable length typically, and they're creating sound by, by getting those things vibrate, those strings vibrating, primarily in their fundamental vibrational mode, but also some of the harmonics. And some of the character of the instrument comes from the, the, the extent to which the other harmonics are present in the vibrations of the strings. So you sort of can tell, well, that's, that's, a, that's this instrument as opposed to that instrument. <clears throat> All right. Um, next topic to talk about a little bit is, is, is the creation of the sound from a string, or actually from most instruments. The string, when it vibrates, <clears throat> moves back and forth, and the air tends to scoot around it. 
you know, it gets in the way of the air, or the air gets in its way, but the air flows around it, and the usual story of, of, of fluid dynamics shows up, right? It's, it, it's got pressure imbalances, it goes around, it's got viscosity, all that pressure drag, turbulence, the whole works. But the long and short of it is that a string is terrible at really compressing the air at all. The air just goes around it as it vibrates up and down. So if I take, if I take my rope here even, and I go up and down with the rope or around in a circle, the air is just scooting around that. And so I'm not really compressing the air at any given moment by any significant amount, nor am I rarefying it, which is sort of the opposite of compressing it, stretching it apart. The, the result is that it's, this is terrible at emitting sound. Strings don't do a good job at all. Um, by themselves, strings are almost silent, even when they're vibrating fast, and there should be a sound associated with that. So where does the sound come? The sound in virtually all stringed instruments comes not from the string, but from a surface that moves with the string. Why? Because surfaces are a whole lot better at sort of getting the attention of the air and squeezing it or unsqueezing it. And what sound is, and so I should step aside and say, what, you know, what's a sound? Sound is a disturbance that goes through air and it goes through air in the form of compressions and rarefactions of the air, where the air's density goes up as it's being squeezed together, and the air's density goes down as it's being unsqueezed. So there are fluctuations in the, in the density of the air. And air vibrates about a, a, it, it vibrates about a stable equilibrium. The stable equilibrium is uniform pressure and density. That's what it likes to be at if it leave it alone. But if you compress some of the air here locally, you have disturbed it away from equilibrium. It now vibrates back and forth about that equilibrium as another harmonic oscillator, or a bunch of, actually bunches of harmonic oscillators. It's got some of the same physics as that string, except that there's no end to it. And the fact that a, a string has an end, you get these motions of the string that don't go anywhere. They sort of dan it's sort of dancing in place. And these are described as standing waves. Physicists think of these as standing waves. It's a wave. It's a wave. It looks like a wave, but it's not going left or right. It's sitting still. And that's, that's the typical behavior of extended objects that, is, that have many parts, but that don't go on forever. They end. Okay? So extended objects have standing waves as their basic modes. The air, because in effect it goes on forever, and the sea, because it goes on forever, they have waves that don't stand, uh, that actually travel. They go somewhere. And in the, so the air, I, mean, I won't do, do full justice to it because it's enough is enough, but when I, when I get the air jiggling here, it's kind of dancing up and down like the string, except it can move. The, the, the waves, I'm making waves, and the waves are heading off across the air, and they, when, the, when an air pressure, fluctuation wave goes by you, the pressure and density are fluctuating, they push and pull and push and pull on your eardrum, and the structure's in there, and you hear sound. So that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm launching these ripples, these jigglings about stable equilibrium that head off across the room and, and reach you. And for, to, to do that launching process, I've got to get the ear's attention. I have to actually squeeze it tight and unsqueeze it, squeeze it and unsqueeze it, and strings don't do that well. In fact, lots of Narrow things don't do that well. So what do you do? You use a surface. So the reason that, that a guitar has the big fancy box around it, an acoustic guitar, I should say, it has a big fancy box about it is because the strings by themselves would be almost silent. If you just got rid of the box and just, or just, just use a, a solid piece of wood here, as you would on an electric guitar, it's not very loud. You can barely hear it. Electric guitar without the electric is kind of quiet, for those of you who've ever played one. You need the box to launch the sound. That surface going in and out on both sides is responsible for launching the sound. And as an example of that, I mean, I mean clearly, the, the, the uh, tuning forks are, are, are one example. Another one is a music box. So this music box. There are little teeny, uh, like fork tines, vibrating up and down, being plucked by, 
Okay? So that guy, I, now of course having started it, I can't stop it. Put it, put it, all right, <laughs> put it away. This is the same kind of music box. I don't know whether this is also the, it's the Alfred Hitchcock theme called the Funeral March or the Marionettes. Anyway, I don't know where this is that same, I forget. But anyway, this doesn't have the box. Now it's got the tines are vibrating by themselves, but it's not, nothing else is going. And this guy, it's pretty quiet. How do I make it louder? Actually, can you hear it back there? Yeah, it's hi-ho, hi-ho. We're off to work we go. But it's almost silent without the, without the box. So um, a lot of musical instruments have sound bores or, or acoustic surfaces that are like piano. A piano, just the strings, very quiet. It's got a soundboard on a, on a grand piano. It's the bottom of the piano. Uh, upright piano, it's, it's part of the back of the piano. Very carefully made soundboard, critical to the sound of the piano. Uh, typically, one of the failure modes of a piano is, is a broken soundboard. So they're carefully cut and machined. You know, it's craftsman work to make, to make those soundboards that launch the sound nicely. All right. Um, This demonstration, just for fun, is the type of wave that is air. Is the air is moving back and forth toward, along the direction of travel. So as I'm talking to you, I'm pushing, I'm compressing the air to, you know, toward you away. The air is, is being compressed and uncompressed in this direction, in the same direction as the travel of the wave. That is different from the wave on an ocean, where the motion is up and down as the wave heads horizontally. This, this, Compression along and rarefaction along the travel direction is called a longitudinal wave. The names don't matter. But, but that is different from the, the motion of water on, a, on, a, on the ocean is up and down as it's traveling horizontally. That's called a transverse wave. And there, this is a toy with magnets in it that repel each other. And I can launch a longitudinal wave on it by pushing the first one. So that was a longitudinal wave. The motion is in the same direction as the wave travels. You'll notice the wave bounced off the end and came backwards. The reflections like that, that that's typical of waves. Ah, I can show you more reflections of waves. Waves love to bounce off things, particularly ends of, ends of their travel space. OK, so this is all about strings so far. And a lot of instruments are strings, but not all of them. A fair number of the instruments are wind instruments or variations on it, brass instruments. What's vibrating in wind instruments is not the instrument anymore. It's the air in the instrument. And it turns out that when you trap air in a confined space and protect it from the outside air in the atmosphere, the pressure inside it can, can vary and be different from atmospheric. So the this is protected except at its ends. This is just a drinking straw. The pressure in the middle of the straw can go higher than atmospheric, at least for a moment, and lower than atmospheric, at least for a moment. And so you can get weird things like have the air at both ends rushing into the straw and accumulating at the center so its density and pressure go up. And then moments later, because that's, that has pressure imbalances, the air will turn around and bounce out. It'll fly out both ends, and you'll have low pressure in the middle and back and forth and back and forth. And I can get that motion going by, well, a couple of ways, but one of them, I can blow across it, which is what I'll do. It's not very convincing with this, but I don't have, yeah. It's, if I close the bottom, now the bounce is off my, th my finger, and now the pressure, the air rushes in the top, and it accumulates the bottom and out, out the top and, and, and vanishes from the bottom. This has another vibration. And just for the sake of time and energy, I'll shift away from a straw and go to a bottle. So when I, do, when I get the motion going up and down in the bottle, the air will rush into it and accumulate the bottom. And then rush out of it, and you'll get low pressure at the bottom. Then high pressure at the bottom, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. 
that's that that's the that that's what's happening when that make the sound is that bouncing process in and out in and out and by blowing across it, I'm, I'm, I'm basically using it as a whistle. This is how whistles behave. The air that I'm blowing across it tends to follow the air flowing in or out of the, out of the bottle. So that if, if air was flowing into the bottle for some random reason, my blowing adds to it and, and, and helps the air rush in. And when the air is flowing out, my air subtract, subtracts from it, heads out with it, and helps to suck out the air. So whistles get the natural residence going by adding and subtracting air from the bottle. Um, my, my least favorite version of whistle is, is a car when, when one person opens the window. You know that woo -woo 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 feeling you, that you experience? That's the whistle. That's, that's the air blowing in, into the bottle, out of the bottle, into the car, out of the car, into the car, out of the car, and it, it accumulates the far end. So the person who's sitting there at the, at, at the window is getting air rushing back and forth in front of them, and they don't notice that very much. But the person at the far end of the car is experiencing the pressure up, pressure down, pressure up. So that's your ears going, woo, 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 woo. and then not so fun. Anyhow, this motion, uh, it's tunable. You can change the frequency. How do you do that? Make the, make the column shorter. It's a, it's a column of air in there. So if I make the column shorter, Pitch went up. So just as with the rope, the, the pitch of these columns of air vibrating depend on the mass, which is the density of the air, and the stiffness of the restoring force, because the restoring force is associated with trying to have uniform air pressure. And the longer the pipe or bottle, the lower the pitch. Um, changing the density of air is a little tough, but I can change the gas for helium. Mm. That swoop, you know, why does it start high? It's because it's helium initially, and helium responds faster, so it goes through the motion faster. Mm. And that's why. I can talk like Donald Duck for a little while when I do that. Because all the pitches are way up. And there, you know, of course, ah, no, OK. Um, all right, so two more demonstrations of, the, of, of air columns vibrating. So all these wind instruments, you know, the, the, all the woodwinds, you know, oboe and whatever, and all the uh, brass instruments, tr trombone, trumpet, tuba, they're all columns of air uh, vibrating. And as they, as they get longer, the pitches go down. Um, they have to, incidentally, they all have to p adjust their tones to match the temperature of the room. Because remember, as the temperature of the room changes, so does the density of air. So warming up is literally warming up. Instruments, as they get hotter, the air in them gets hotter, the wind instruments, and it vibrates more easily. The pitches go up. OK, so more wind instruments that you never saw at, at a, at a, at a um, orchestra. This pipe has. You, the air inside it can, can vibrate back and forth about stable equilibrium, and I can get that going by blowing across it and playing whistle. But, but rather than blowing across it and playing whistle, which is hard, I can swing it. It's hard to get the fundamental. I'm trying to get the fundamental. It goes into harmonics really easily. Oh, well, whatever. I can't get the fundamental on that guy at all. Let me try the fundamental on this one. The, these are the bugle pitches, right? So if you listen to a bugle, a bugle is just a pipe. It has no valves. And the pitches are only, are only the harmonics. The harmonics, incidentally, occur when you have multiple regions of peak density. So that the, the motions are not just all in at the ends, piling up in the middle. There are things like, in at this end, piling up here, moving left and right, piling up here, moving left and right, piling up here, and then moving in and out at the ends. So you can get harmonics with that. One last demonstration, and then I will have done them all. Uh, let me see where this is. Is the gas turned on here? Yes. 
to get really long pipes going, oddly enough, you can use a burner. All right. So, again, I mean, I, probably if I, if I whip this around, I could get it, play whistle games and get the air vibrating in it. But instead, I'm going to use a, a, a burner down there. Oh, come on. You hear it trying. Probably because it's too short. Boring, boring, longer. Okay. That's the fundamental vibration of this pipe as driven oddly enough by heat. And we got one more longer, actually, and then one more fun and games, and then I'll call it a quits. Okay, the last one. <laughs> this pipe has a metal gauze in it that I can heat up. And it's the rising air by convection that gets this guy going. So it's not the flame. Oops. I, I put out my light. Come on. Oh, come on. I can't do it. All right, well, we love it. Anyway, that's that. Thank you. <laughs>